Now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our keynote speaker of the day, astronaut and Purdue alumnus Jerry Ross. Um, we were told a few years ago that bring an astronaut, Indians love astronauts, and uh, we'll fill the room. So uh, we did. Jerry Ross was born in Crown Point, Indiana. He received Bachelor of Science and Master of Science degrees in mechanical engineering, the right department, from Purdue University. Uh, a U.S. Air Force ROTC student at Purdue, he received his commission upon graduation and entered active duty in the Air Force. Uh, he has flown 21 different types of aircraft, holds a private pilot's license, and has logged more than 4,100 flying hours. Ross was selected by NASA as an astronaut in 1980, a veteran of seven space flights. Ross has more than 1,393 hours in space, including 58 hours and 18 minutes of extravehicular activity on nine spacewalks. I don't know how many of you watch gravity in movies like that, but it scares the heck out of me thinking about extravehicular walks and such. But he came back. <laughs> so, and you can shake his hand. Um, he was the first human to be launched into space seven times and shares the world record for the largest number of space flights with, one other, with only one other NASA astronaut. Ross was awarded two Defense Superior Service Medals, the Air Force Legion of Merit Award, four Defense Meritorious Service Medals, there's a long list here, two Air Force Meritorious Service Medals, and the National Intelligence Medal of Achievement. Purdue rec has recognized Ross as well with an honorary doctorate degree and the Distinguished Engineering Alumnus Award. In 2014, Ross was inducted into the Astronaut Hall of Fame. Ross is a lifetime member of the Association of Space Explorers and the Purdue Alumni Association. You could all get that too. You don't have to be an astronaut to do that. He released his first book, an autobiography. It's called Space Walker, My Journey in Space and Faith as NASA's record-setting frequent flyer in 2013. He and his wife, Karen, have two children. Please help me welcome Colonel Jerry Ross to the stage. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Garmella. It's uh, exciting for me to be here today. I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing the questions that you give me at the end of my presentation, but also I'm looking forward to listening to all the other speakers and the topics that they're addressing. I am delighted to join you here for the 150th Purdue University uh, celebration and to participate in this collaboratory uh, lecture series that is in honor of Professor C.N.R. Rao. And it indeed was an honor for me to meet him earlier this week, certainly one of our most esteemed Purdue graduates ever. I am very encouraged and pleased to see the progress, by the way, that India has made in space exploration. I think it's all been very impressive. and I'm looking forward to seeing more progress in the future. In 1869, when Purdue University was founded, there were no automobiles, no airplanes, no computers, no rockets, and no satellites. Worldwide, food sources were tentative. Healthcare was relatively primitive. Educational opportunities for the average person were limited and economic prosperity was concentrated to the few. Life expectancy for most of the people in the world was only 35 to 40 years. But in 150 years, even though the world's population has increased from 1.3 billion people to 7.7 .7 billion inhabitants, all those aspects of life have greatly improved for nearly all the inhabitants of the Earth, and life expectancy is now 65 to 85 years. Humanity has made giant leaps in the past 150 years, but mankind is certainly faced with much room for additional improvement. Purdue University will continue to be a leader in facing these challenges. Now, my granddaughters think that I'm pretty old, but I am not 150 years old yet. And yet, many of these giant leaps that have happened during my lifetime, which is almost 71 years now, especially in the areas of aeronautics and space. 
I was born January 20th, 1948. That was just months before, uh, just months before I was born. Chuck Yeager flew the experimental Bell X-1 aircraft to fashion the speed of sound and became the first man to break the sound barrier. Just 10 days after I was born, Orville Wright, who along with his brother Wilbur invented the first successful airplane, died. Many years later, I was delighted to discover that I was their cousin. When I was a child growing up in Northwest Indiana, there were no spacemen, and people joked that the moon was made of cheese. When people wanted to emphasize how unlikely something was to happen, they would say, you might as well fly to the moon. No one even remotely believed that was going to be a possibility. But by the time I was in the first grade, scientists and engineers were discussing the feasibility of launching satellites into space. I became excited about the possibilities and began making scrapbooks about rockets, satellites, and space flight. In 1957 and 1958, when I was in the fourth grade, the first satellites were actually launched into space, first by the Soviet Union, followed by the United States. And I decided in 1958, when I was in the fourth grade, that I was going to go to Purdue University, that I was going to become an engineer, didn't know about mechanical at that point yet, and that I was going to get involved in our country's space program. We uh, started human space flight in 1961 when the Russian uh, Yuri Gagarin flew into space and shortly followed by American Alan Shepard, uh, first becoming the first two representatives from their countries to make those incredible voyages. Just a few years later, when Purdue University celebrated its 100th anniversary, I was a student on campus and at Purdue and pursuing my first degree in mechanical engineering. I was fulfilling the first steps of my plan to become involved in space exploration. In 1969, I, along with the rest of the absolutely amazed world, witnessed Purdue's favorite son, astronaut Neil Armstrong, land on the moon and make that one giant leap for mankind. That singular event changed the whole path of human history, and I think it has helped to firmly establish a society that eagerly uses science to solve problems and to make profound changes for the betterment of all mankind. Purdue educated engineers, scientists, and managers have been involved in most of these endeavors and have contributed significantly to these efforts. This is especially true in the space exploration. In fact, by the end of the U.S. space shuttle program, nearly one-third of all the U.S. human space missions in the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo programs, as well as the space shuttle program, had at least one Purdue graduate on them. We are proud to say that we have 24 astronauts who graduated from Purdue University. Now, with that preface, I'm going to uh, do a little bit of a uh, PowerPoint presentation to show you about growing up in Indiana, how I became an astronaut, what I did during that time. Uh, then we'll be uh, looking at a video. And after that, uh, I'll finish up by talking about Mars, and then we'll have some questions. You ready? OK, here we go. So uh, that's me, the short guy there. This is when I was about six years old growing up in northwest Indiana. This is my grandfather, my dad's dad. You probably can't see him very well, but my best four-legged friend is right here, a black cocker spaniel called Prancer. And Prancer and I got into a lot of trouble. I blamed him and he blamed me, so we got along pretty well that way. But this picture was taken when I was about in the first grade, about six years old. And this is when I started to hear her talk about launching satellites into space someday. And this is when my mother helped me make scrapbooks that led to my decision to go to Purdue and be an engineer. This is our family picture when I was in the fourth grade. 
I probably wasn't real happy wearing that bow tie there, but that's okay. My dad worked in the steel mills in Gary, Indiana. My mom was a stay-at-home mother until all uh, three of us kids were in school. And uh, my, then she became a school secretary. And my two sisters, Judy and Janet, followed me to Purdue, and they both became teachers. So in addition to deciding I was going to go to Purdue, I also started working on building and flying model rockets. I was going to learn the rocket business from the ground up, if you will. And this was the first opportunity to make noise and smoke and, uh, and have some flame coming out the back end. Now, in my book, I talk about killing one of my sister's uh, pet white mice. She doesn't let me forget it even yet today. But you learn more from it, sometimes for failures than you do successes all the time, is what I point out to her. So, When I was at Purdue working on a master's program, I did uh, some work on a uh, ramjet engine out at the test facility at the high-pressure uh, laboratory out by the airport at Purdue. Uh, and uh, another opportunity to make smoke and fire and noise. Of course, this is where I wanted to get to. This is a space shuttle. It was an incredible vehicle, 180 feet tall from the tip of that large brown external tank all the way down to the base of the solid rocket motors. Altogether, fully fueled and ready for launch, that combination weighed about four and a half million pounds. And at liftoff, we were generating about six and a half million pounds of thrust. By the time we cleared the launch pad, we were already going over 100 miles an hour. In 40 seconds, that four and a half million pounds of hardware was going straight up and accelerated to the faster than the speed of sound. Those large white solid rocket boosters consumed over a million pounds of solid rocket propellant in them in the first two minutes. And at that point, when we jettisoned them back down to the surface of the Earth, we were already about 25 miles high and traveling at over four times the speed of sound. Would you fly with that bunch of people in space? This was a fun picture that my first crew took. And uh, you can see that uh, the two of us here in our white spacewalking suits uh, designated that we were going to go outside. So that was a fun picture. Here's something of what we did on orbit. We launched three communication satellites from the payload bay of the space shuttle. One was for Australia, one for, for Mexico, and the third one was a uh, commercial communication satellite. We also conducted two spacewalks. That's me up there on the top. And my buddy down here, I had red stripes on my suit. Um, we did investigations of how you might build structures in space someday looking at the concepts of maybe building a space station or something like that in the future. And I thought it was great to go outside on spacewalks and float in, in the nothingness of the, of the universe. Another view of me and a foot restraint on the end of the robotic arm. This was built by the Canadians and provided it to us to use on the space shuttle. There's also one on the space station. But this was a 45-foot long truss that we built and disassembled multiple times to, uh, again, evaluate another way of building structures in space. My second flight, we flew uh, at a higher inclination orbit, and I was able to uh, take a picture of the southern tip of Lake Michigan. This is the Chicago area right up here. The steel mills where my dad worked and where I worked summers when I was going through college. This is I-65 that goes from West Lafayette, where Purdue is at, straight up to the Chicago area. This is my hometown right here. This is the road that comes out of my hometown. There is the road I lived on, and that's where I grew up as a kid, right there. It was pretty cool to be able to look down on that area from on orbit and think about what it was like when I was a kid at night laying on some freshly baled hay and looking up at the stars and wondering what it would be like to fly up there someday. Incredible feeling. On my third flight, we uh, deployed the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, which was a sister telescope to the Hubble Space Telescope, but where the Hubble Space Telescope looked at the universe in basically the same frequency range what the human eye can see as it sounds, the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory was looking at the universe in the gamma ray spectrum. And the gamma rays come from the most explosive events out there, so they were very important to astrophysicists, 
and we had an antenna boom that did not deploy on this antenna when it was commanded to do so. And so we had to go out on an unplanned emergency spacewalk, and I put some of my good old country farm boy uh, knowledge to good use, and I kicked that antenna, and it came out, and I was able to put it in a position and lock it, and that allowed this uh, $630 million telescope to go off and do some incredible research that caused astrophysicists to rethink most of the theories about gamma ray sources and their distribution in the universe. And for me, as an engineer, anytime you can cause scientists to rethink their theories, that's been a good day. Okay, here's another fun picture of a crew on my fourth flight. I flew as a payload commander on a space lab mission that was sponsored by the German uh, Space Agency. And in this picture, you can see all the Americans wearing their German Leiterhosen, which is uh, customary German beer drinking costumes. And all of the Germans are in their Western attire with their cowboy hats and, and cowboy boots. And we even convinced three of our secretaries to come out and be the beer garden maidens for us in the pictures. So you got to have some fun in, this, in the space program. It's a lot of hard work, and you need to, to enjoy it when you can. This mission was incredible. We conducted uh, experiments inside the laboratory that was out in the pale bay of the space shuttle. 24 hours a day for 10 days in a row. We conducted almost 90 different experiments over those 10 days. And we had two shifts of people that were out there working on 12-hour shifts to get everything done. As this is uh, one of the experiments we did, which was looking at how the human uh, lungs change in uh, their performance and activity as you get into zero gravity. And uh, here's, whoop, I thought I had another one. Okay, we're on to the next flight now. My fifth flight was a, a visit to the Russian space station Mir, where we attached a docking module to the Mir, which was used by all the subsequent space shuttle visits to Mir as, as a safer way to dock to that space station. This is a, a view of the crew, uh, a Russian crew member on the station, another Russian, the commander on the station, a German uh, uh, worker on the space station, our commander, American, and a Canadian on our space shuttle crew. This uh, document that they're holding is a United Nations, a copy of the United Nations uh, agreement that is, guarantees uh, safe return of crew members should they land in somebody's other country in an emergency situation. And uh, basically almost every country on the planet is signed on that accord. So we flew this and returned it to the United Nations after the mission. This is the Mir station after we had undocked and were departing. And this gold piece down here is the part that we had added onto the space station. It was really neat to go to visit some people that were living in space already. And it was also really neat to get my first experience actually doing some assembly work on a space station up there. My sixth flight was a really a neat flight. We started the assembly of the International Space Station. The Russians had launched the component on an unmanned rocket a month before we launched. We carried another component up in the payload bay of the orbiter. We uh, mated them together, and uh, this is me outside on one of the three spacewalks we committed on, we uh, conducted on this flight to uh, attach everything together. And uh, this puts a great big smile on my face every time I think about being in on the ground floor of the, of the start of the International Space Station. Some views inside as we continue to do some work inside as well after we completed most of the activities outside. And again, we uh, set the stage for permanent pr uh, presence on the International Space Station, which has been continuous for over 20 years now. Uh, final view uh, as we undock from the, uh, the cornerstone, if you will, of the International Space Station. This is what, what was came up upon the Russian rocket, and this is what we brought up on the payload bay of the space shuttle. My last flight was uh, a continuation of the assembly of the International Space Station. That's me out there hanging out in the breeze. This section right here is what we brought up. It was a total of 43 feet long, weighed about 30,000 pounds. It was called S0. It was the center section of the truss on the International Space Station. And to me, it was kind of like the uh, boiler room of the International Space Station. Most of the electrical systems were either contained in there or the electrical power is routed through there. 
and likewise for most of the cooling systems on the station. Now I'm going to show you a video now of this mission. Uh, there were seven crew members on the flight, three rookies and uh, four veterans as uh, the math would come out. And we had uh, two different teams of spacewalkers uh, that did first and third spacewalk and the second and fourth spacewalk. And I led the team that did the second and fourth spacewalk. My uh, co-spacewalker was uh, uh, also a rookie, and he was also a grandfather like me. So we were the first pair of grandfathers to do spacewalks in space. The rest of the crew called us the Silver Team. There were some other names they had for us too, but we ignored those. So if you'll help me out here with a countdown, we'll go to end of the video. Three, two, one, here we go. Our crew patch. There's a shuttle out of the launch pad, 180 feet tall, four and a half million pounds, fully fueled and ready to go. Here we come out of the crew quarantine facility. Check out my hair here. It never stays combed, probably isn't right now, and it only gets worse from zero gravity, as you'll see. Some uh, video now of us getting strapped into the cockpit. This is Steve Frick, a rookie uh, pilot on the crew. This is Jeannie Alexander. I think Jeannie strapped me into all seven of my flights. I'm going to sit right between those two guys. The shuttle's main engines were started 6.6 .6 seconds before liftoff. That's to make sure they're all going to work properly before we lift those very large solid rocket boosters on the side, because when you lift those, you were committed to the launch. There was no turning around. On my fourth flight, one of those engines didn't work right, and we shut down the launch attempt three seconds before we lifted off. A view inside is the shuttle's main engines are, lifting, are starting up, and that's when the solid rocket motors ignited there. There's a real kick in the pants, a lot of vibration, and you, you really know you're along for a ride at that point. The space shuttle did a, a maneuver we called the roll program, which pointed the shuttle in the right direction to get us to our desired orbit. 40 seconds after liftoff, we're going to go supersonic. In two minutes, we use up over a million pounds of solid rocket propellant in each of those uh, large white boosters. They're jettisoned and uh, parachuted back down to the water and recovered and reused. But it takes us another six and a half minutes using the liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen in that large brown tank through the shuttle's three main engines to get us into orbit. At this point, when those solid rocket motors come off, again, we're about 25 miles high and over four times the speed of sound. This is the opening of the payload bay, payload bay doors of the orbiter once you get onto orbit. Those shiny surfaces are radiators that we use to cool the systems. This is the mechanism we're going to use to dock to the station, and that's the S0 truss that you'll see again later. Our commander in his seat getting ready to start a rocket firing, which will lift our orbit up to help us catch up to the space station. We told the guys downstairs to hold on, otherwise they would have got splatted against the back wall, and they're going to hang on to a strap here so they can look cool and look like Superman. This is Steve Smith and Rex Walheim, who were the spacewalkers on the first and third uh, spacewalks. This is Dr. Ellen Ochoa. Ellen was our flight engineer on the flight. She was also our chief robotics operator. She was also, until very recently, the center director at the Johnson Space Center. And she's now retired and off in Idaho doing snowshoeing out there in the wilderness where nobody can bother her, I think. Here we are the day we're getting ready to dock the station. A view of the S0 truss element in the payload bay of the shuttle. This is Atlantis, by the way, which I flew five of my seven flights on. That uh, picture was obviously taken by the crew in the station. This is where we're going to dock to the station. And this is the hatch that will go outside on our four spacewalks that we had planned to do. Remember, the space shuttle and space station are both going around the world at about five miles per second, eight kilometers per second. And we have to come in at a very slow and deliberate pace to dock to the station. And you have to have very uh, precise alignment. Once we had captures, you'll see here in a second, then I operated this system that pulled the two halves together. And around the perimeter was a series of hooks that we closed to structurally hold us together. The commander was pretty laid back, but he was pretty excited about a good docking. You can see my hair was standing straight up. It was so excited. We did some leak checks, and then we opened up the hatches leading into the, uh, 
the International Space Station. This is uh, Yuri Gudzinko, or sorry, Yuri yeah, Gudzinko. Um, he was the commander of the station crew. He had two Americans up there with him. This is my space walking buddy, Lee Morin. This is uh, Steve Frick, our rookie pilot again. Rex Walheim, who you saw later. These two guys here are the Americans on the crew that you'll see face to face here in a minute. Dr. Ochoa coming into the U.S. laboratory with a bag, a bag, a bag, and another one she's holding between her legs here, trying to be efficient as she could be. And uh, she has already started operating this robotic arm that was on the International Space Station and has grappled onto S0 and has started to pull it out of the payload bay. And she'll be manipulating it to get into position to attach it to the outside of the station. This was a very slow process. It took a couple hours. There's Ellen at her workstation. You can see some TV views projected on some uh, computer screens there. While she was doing that work, I was getting Steve uh, Smith and Rex Walheim into their spacesuits and all their equipment ready to go out on the first of our four spacewalks. This is part of one of the very large solar arrays that we have to generate the electrical power. And a whole series of views of S0 as is being manipulated in the position. This is one of the problems of flying in space. You have neat things to look at on the ground when you're trying to concentrate on your work. There's the Nile River, pyramids in this area, all the way down to the Nile Delta, Sinai Peninsula, the Mediterranean Sea, the Red Sea. Here's the US laboratory and the Node 1, which I put up on the very first assembly flight. S0 is getting into final position where there's a bar on the bottom of S0, which will be grappled by this claw-like mechanism. And when that was completed, then uh, Dr. Ochoa was given approval to release S0 from the robotic arm. And I was directed to send Steve Smith and Rex Walheim out on the first of our four spacewalks. This is Dan Burst, by the way. Uh, Dan is one of the two US crewmembers on the station. So they removed uh, the, the uh, robotic arm from the S0, and they put a foot restraint on it. And here's the airlock hatch as uh, Steve Smith is getting ready to come out. You might be interested to know that in astronaut charm school, we're told if we see a camera, we're not supposed to wave at it. Stanford grad. Uh, here we are now, helmet mounted camera on Steve Smith's uh, helmet as uh, they were doing some assembly operations. These are fluid lines for cooling. This is Carl Walls, the second U.S. crew member on the station that you had a chance to meet. He's operating a robotic arm now and giving Ellen a, a, a break. And we have put a foot restraint on the end of that robotic arm, and Rex Walheim has put his feet into that uh, foot restraint. And he has unbolted this umbilical tray that had been launched on the outside of S0, and we're getting ready to install it on its on-orbit location. I'm underneath this window inside the space shuttle Atlantis, reading the checklist to him step by step. There's the checklist. Notice how well my hair is behaving today. Boss uh, looking over my shoulder as we're doing everything uh, by the numbers. A view of uh, Steve Smith in the camera view now as uh, he helps Rex do the final mechanical installation of this umbilical tray. Once that was completed, then the next task was to start taking each of these individual cable bundles and releasing them and routing them and then connecting them by sliding the two halves together, as you see here, and then pushing down on the handle, which mated the electrical connections inside. You can see all kinds of electrical cables here, but we also had four telescoping mechanical struts that we had to partially release and extend out and mate to their matching, uh, matching plates, and then tighten down these uh, very large bolts to about 100 foot-pounds of torque each. Of course, we had this Tim Allen Tool Time approved power tool here to uh, assist in that process. The entire truss on the International Space Station is now 360 feet, and they're all held in place by those four struts and those bolts. We're fast forwarding to the next spacewalk now. There's my buddy Lee Morin out on the end of the robotic arm, and he has removed some structure from uh, S0 that was going to get in the way for 
future operations, and he's going to stow it in place. Uh, third spacewalk now, a view of Steve Smith as he has uh, removed this panel, done some rewiring underneath it, and he's now putting the panel back in place. That, is, that panel is there to uh, prevent micrometeorites from uh, putting holes in the uh, laboratory skin. Steve Frick uh, operating the robotic arm, supporting Steve Smith's activities, and the view of some of the switches and circuit breakers. We had over a thousand of them in the shuttle. Some views now from my helmet mounted camera. This is what I was seeing when I was outside. There's the Russian segment of the International Space Station. You can see the curvature of the Earth, the blackness of space, the white clouds, the blue water down below. And this is the light that I have tethered to my wrist that I'm getting ready to attach elsewhere on the outside of the station. There I am out there on a foot restraint on the end of the robotic arm. I have to tell you, this is an amazing way to go to work. What great views. Here I am now looking back at the nose of the Space Shuttle Atlantis. I'm going to attach this light to this stanchion right here and then remove that stanchion and attach it elsewhere on the outside of the station. Now for me, this was the hardest part of the flight. This is going back in at the end of our last spacewalk. I knew this was probably going to be my last fight and also my last spacewalk, and I was not too happy. I was kind of like a kid being called in to get cleaned up for supper, and I wasn't ready to do it yet. This is me already on the airlock uh, wall, and here comes uh, my buddy, Lee Morin in. Lee and I thought for a couple old guys we'd done a really good job, so we're going to give each other some high fives here in a second. Uh, this forward face of the truss is, is used as a railroad track. And this is uh, testing, test driving that little locomotive down a track. We use this to do a lot of the assembly work on the station, and it's still there and still functioning. Uh, the, the station crew had been up there for four months. We were their first visitors, so we thought they deserved some good home cooking. So we brought up some good old Texas barbecue with all the fixings, and they really enjoyed it. You can see we had our denim shirts and our red bandanas, and this is down the lower floor, the mid-deck of the space shuttle. Uh, this is my buddy Lee Morin washing his hair. This is the kitchen facility. This is the hatch you get in out of the shuttle through. This is the door to the bathroom. Steve Frick fly, floating down from the flight deck where we fly the vehicle from. I'm sending an email, I think, home to my wife to remind her to put out the garbage, I think. This is the boss getting some exercise right next to me here. This is where our sleeping bags are stored during the day. All the white lockers are where we store our food and equipment, clothing, experiments, things like that. Here's Lee getting some uh, food out of the oven. Y'all might be interested to know that my wife led the team that made the food that we ate in space. So for years, I would tell people the only time I got a home-cooked meal was when I flew on a mission. <laughs> she never thought that was funny. Uh, there's a total of five college degrees here using this uh, very sophisticated piece of space hardware that you would call a vacuum cleaner. Cleaning some filters. And Steve Frick changing out the lithium hydroxide canisters that we use to uh, take the carbon dioxide that we have exhaled out of the environment so that we don't get to too high a level that would cause us problems. This is me messing around, having a lot of fun. Doesn't that look like fun? Wouldn't you want to do that? Rex Walheim doing the same thing, but I put this one in just so you can see the amount of, of stuff. We had bags of stuff everywhere, and it made it really a challenge to control it all. Steve Smith demonstrating in a very simplistic way why we go into zero gravity to do experiments. It's a ball of water with an air bubble trapped inside it and he's going to add a chocolate candy to it. This is uh, how we sleep in space. You don't need a bed, but you do need something that keeps you from floating around at night. And after being docked to the International Space Station for seven days, it was time for us to uh, undock. And so here we are closing the hatch the night before we undocked in preparation for our departure. The next morning, we got up, and uh, Dr. Ochoa made sure that uh, all the proper information had been entered from the checklist into the space shuttle's computers. And our rookie pilot, Steve Frick, had been given the honor by our commander. 
to do the on-docking and fly away and fly around to the station. At the appropriate time, I pushed a button down here on a panel, which started the departure process. Uh, when the hooks opened up, there were some springs that had been uh, compressed that pushed us apart. Uh, we had a slow rate of departure, but once we had separated by about three or four feet, then Steve Frick started to fire the rocket engines on the space shuttle to increase our rate of separation. We flew out to 450 feet away from the station, and we stopped there and waited for sunrise. This is a real-time sunrise occurring here. You can see the S0 truss element, which is now a total of 360 feet long, and this solar array has been moved way out here to the end. We did a complete fly around of the space station so that we could do photo documentation of the entire exterior. And uh, while we were doing that, the station crew took some pictures of the empty payload bay of the shuttle Atlantis. You can see several different views of the station as we were doing our fly around here. And it kind of looked like a tourist bus at times with everybody in the windows with their cameras. Everybody had different cameras, different film, and specific things that we were supposed to be filming. Uh, one final view of the space station before we fired our thrusters to increase our distance away so we could go off and do our own activities safely. And here we are getting ready to come home, closing the doors, watch the thruster firings there. Uh, just as we had to open those doors to set up our activities on orbit when it was time to come home, we had to close those doors and make sure that they were structurally sound and, and closed so that we had a viable spacecraft to fly home in. Once that was done, we also had a lot of other activities to do inside. Flying in space is kind of like a camping trip. When you get up there, you have to set up your camp. When it's time to come home, you have to tear everything down and restow it. And here we are busily doing those activities. Once those were completed, then it was time for us to all get back into our orange launch and entry suits. And uh, once somebody was into their orange launch and entry suit, then I would take them to their appropriate seat, strap them in, hook up their communication and cooling and uh, oxygen supplies, and, uh, and then when all of us were in our suits and our seats, then it was time for us to fire the rocket engines to start the process of going home. We fired the rocket engines halfway around the world from where we wanted to land, and we were landing at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida on this flight. And one hour after we fired the rocket engines, we expected to be landing on the runway. Here we are crashing back into the Earth's atmosphere at 25 times the speed of sound. That created temperatures on the outside of the, uh, in the Earth's atmosphere, and that plasma that you're seeing of over 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit. Remember when the space shuttle came home, it was about a 240,000 pound glider. There were no engines working, and you had to do the landing on the first try. Some views of uh, what we called a heads-up display that the commander and pilot saw projected into their windows. We're descending through 13,000 feet. We're at 292 knots. This is guidance information telling us where to point the spacecraft to land on the runway down here. The commander is flying the vehicle at a very steep angle with respect to the ground at 300 nautical miles per hour. And we would create a big smoking hole right there if we didn't start to pull the nose of the orbiter up, which we're doing here. 1,500 feet above the ground, we start to pull the nose of the orbiter up, and the commander is aiming to land about 2,000 feet down the runway with a sink rate of about one to two feet per second and at an airspeed of about 200 miles per hour. What an incredible flying machine. We're going to change topics. You know, there were times in my uh, early astronaut career that I thought I had a good chance of going to the moon and maybe also to Mars. But now I am much more pessimistic about the chances of the United States seriously pursuing a program to put human beings on the surface of Mars and bring them safely home. Maybe China or a consortium of countries will do it, but I am pretty well convinced the United States will not do it at least not by ourselves. During my years at NASA and since, three different U.S. presidents have given NASA direction to implement programs to place Americans on Mars. The first two initiatives didn't make much progress before they were abandoned, and we are now just starting the third directive. 
The main problem is that such a uh, major undertaking will take many years to accomplish and in many billions of dollars to complete it. Attaining this goal would require strong and continued support from Congress, as well as future presidents over several decades. Uh, and therefore, the strong, sustained support of the American public is required to keep the effort funded at a level that will permit pr progress at a reasonable rate. My experience is that there has not been and is not currently that level of public and congressional support to carry the program to successful conclusion of landing human beings on the surface of Mars. For many years, the United States and other countries, and many times in cooperation with each other, have been sending unmanned robotic spacecraft to Martian orbit and to the surface of Mars to study that fascinating planet. We have learned much about the planet and its environment, we have even discovered significant evidence of previous existence of water on the surface of Mars and also evidence of considerable water ice on or below the surface of the planet now. To, uh, to me, this makes the possibility of discovering previous life forms on Mars to be considerably enhanced from what we once thought. We have also identified the presence of chemical compounds on Mars that are some of the building blocks of life forms here on the Earth. And here on the Earth, we have continued to discover new life forms that live in environments that were thought to be incapable of supporting life. All, find, all these findings increase the support of the possibility that we would find evidence of previous life forms on Mars someday. So, what if one of our current or future robotic spacecraft found strong evidence of previous life forms on Mars. What would the societal and emotional ramifications be if we confirmed that the Earth was not the only place where life forms developed? Now, I must state that I'm imagining microscopic uh, life forms like bacteria or maybe some small plant forms, definitely not complex human-like UFOs or aliens. But even at that, the impact on our global society will be immediate and pivotal in mankind's history. If we did find of evidence of life on Mars, I think that there would be an overwhelming swelling of support from nations all over the Earth to pursue and fund uh, sending human beings to, to Mars. I think that just as we have built and operated the International Space Station and many other collaborative efforts uh, on robotic space missions, this effort would be an international effort with contribu contrib contributions from many nations. However, mankind is far from being ready to send human beings to Mars. We need to develop many critical technical capabilities before we can proceed. Developing systems for manned missions to Mars will require a careful balancing act between assuring that the vehicle can safely reach and re and return from Mars and figuring out how to use the least amount of fuel possible in order to minimize the launch weight. We should start our preparations now. And in order to develop these capabilities, I firmly believe we should first go to the moon. The moon is a journey of only three days from the Earth, which makes the moon an easy place from which to retreat if the systems that we are developing and using on the moon should fail. We need to learn how to live on the moon, how to explore and utilize its resources, and we need to develop the systems and capabilities to live on the moon for extended periods of time with little or no resupply from the Earth. We need to develop and use the technical systems on the moon first to demonstrate their functionality and reliability before we can be confident to proceed to Mars. So what are some of the systems that we need to develop and fully demonstrate their long duration functioning on the moon? I'm gonna highlight just a few, but rest assured this is certainly not an exhaustive list. But it should give you a pause for thought and also give you an impression of how difficult it will be to conduct a human mission to Mars. The first is a system to generate electrical power. The moon is close enough to our sun that we could probably get along 
with solar cell arrays to provide our electric power needs on the moon. But there are many problems with that, uh, where to place the solar arrays to capture the sun's energies during all 28 days of a lunar cycle. We would need very large batteries, which would be very heavy and would be difficult to get to the surface of the moon. Uh, we would need very large arrays. And uh, the bottom line is solar arrays on Mars are probably not all that feasible because it's a lot further away from the sun. And there are dust storms up there which could easily degrade their performance significantly. Therefore, I believe that we need uh, highly reliable, fully automated nuclear power plant that will supply the electricity to support all of our operations on the moon. In fact, I most likely uh, think that we would need two of them for redundancy. The development of this power source is, and of itself, an expensive endeavor and an engineering challenge. We should start on it now. It will take a long time to make it ready, and generating electricity uh, using nuclear energy will be a very useful capability to have on the moon until we're ready to go to Mars anyhow. We will need an extremely highly reliable, fully closed cycle environmental system that will provide regeneration of all the water and will supply our oxygen requirements. We cannot possibly send all the water and oxygen to the moon that will be required for long duration, uh, long duration missions there and the requirements for missions to Mars absolutely dictate that such highly reliable and fully closed environmental systems will be required for these missions. We are making significant advances in some of these critical systems on the International Space Station right now, but much more effort will be needed to reach the levels of reliability and performance that will be undoubtedly necessary for the long duration missions to Mars. A combination of techniques to protect crew members from the, highly, uh, the higher radiation levels and more dangerous types of radiation uh, that will be experienced during a flight to Mars must be found. The Van Allen radiation belt that surrounds the Earth protects crew members when uh, we are flying at lower altitudes in Earth orbit, uh, which is most of the flights we've had to date. Only the Apollo lunar missions and a couple of Gemini flights flew at higher altitudes, and those were short missions of only a week or so in duration. The Martian mission crew members will be exposed to these higher radiation levels for months. There must be, uh, they must be protected by a combination of means such as radiation shields, medications, and operational procedures. Using current rocket technologies will result in a long flight duration to and from Mars. The current estimates are that flights to Mars will take between six and nine months, and the crew would have to stay on Mars or one of its moons or in the vicinity of Mars for about a year or so before the planets will realign and permit a relatively quick six to nine month return flight. We need new rocket technologies that will significantly reduce these flight durations. A reduced duration helps to make all other aspects of the missions be less challenging. There would be less radiation exposure and less food, water, oxygen, spare parts, clothes, and other supplies required for the mission. My friend and fellow seven-time space flyer Franklin Chang Diaz is working on a variable specific impulse magnetoplasma rocket, which he has called VASMR. VASMR uses radio uh, waves to ionize and heat the propellant to extremely high temperatures. The propellant is then accelerated, accelerated by very strong magnetic fields to generate thrust. Franklin believes that his rocket could shorten the flight to and from Mars from nine months to about three months. We would need to, ex we need to expedite the, the development of Franklin's rocket and we will also need to develop and provide another nuclear power source for this critical enabling technology to make human flights to Mars, to Mars practical. Landing a spacecraft on Mars is much more difficult to do than landing a spacecraft here on the Earth or even on the Moon. We use the Earth's dense atmosphere to greatly slow the velocity of the landing vehicle and then to parachute a capsule to the surface 
or to land a shuttle on a runway. We gladly welcome the lower gravity of the moon to markedly reduce the amount of rocket fuel required to bring the landing vehicle from lunar orbit to the moon's surface. Mars's atmosphere is very thin. This greatly limits the amount of deceleration that it can provide for space vehicles entering the Martian atmosphere and landing on the surface of the planet. The Martian atmosphere is also much less uniform than the Earth's. Also, Mars has a gravity that is uh, over two times as great as the moon's. These factors make the task of landing on Mars much more difficult than on the Earth or the moon. Radio signals to and from Mars will take minutes to travel over that long distance. Our current reliance upon ground control teams to monitor spacecraft in real time and to provide nearly instantaneous assistance to crews will not work for missions to Mars. The space vehicles will need to have smarter systems and the crews will need more knowledge and better systems management tools that will enable them to perform all the normal and emergency activities in an autonomous manner. The crew members flying on a Mars mission will have to be nearly superhuman, not like me, to deal with all the technical crew health and emotional aspects of this epic mission. They will need to be able to operate all the systems of multiple spacecraft with little time, timely support from the Earth. They will need to be skilled in medical care, and they will need to be able to cope with long separations from home and family. The microbial environment inside the spacecraft is an example of the types of threats that they will potentially have to face. NASA scientists recently identified five previously unknown strains of of enterobacter bacteria aboard the International Space Station. These are of the same genus as those found in hospitals and which have a high resistance to antibiotics. These bacteria often infect patients who have compromised immune systems. How will a crew member uh, manage a bacterial emergency during a two to a two and a half year flight to and from Mars? Eyesight changes over long durations in microgravity and potential toxic conditions from a type of compound known as perchlorates that have been detected on, in the Martian soil are other possible medical issues to be addressed. Now, as I indicated, I have only highlighted a few of the many systems that will need to be developed and fully demonstrated to permit human beings to go to Mars. There are literally thousands of issues to be addressed. Many giant leaps will be needed to achieve the landing of human beings on the surface of Mars. We need to start developing all these capabilities and critical technologies now. The best way I know to assure the successful achievement of these momentous giant leaps is to send your best and brightest students to Purdue University, where they will receive world-class educations. The world will need the most intelligent and best prepared people, and they're in innovative ideas to realize the incredible adventure of going to Mars. What a day that would be. I can see Purdue's banner proudly, be de proudly being displayed on the surface of Mars. Hail Purdue. Me, also an alum of electrical engineering, to join us on stage and um, help conduct the Q&A. Rajan is Vice Chair, uh, Managing Director and CEO of Jet Synthesis, and he's joining Jerry now for a 10-minute Q&A so we can stay on time. Thanks, thanks, Jerry. Wow, Jerry, I mean, Jeff, what a lovely, what a lovely presentation. And come on, I think we need a big hand of applause for a life. Now you know why I smile a lot. I know. I know, for, for what a wonderful life you have lived. You know, Suresh, fun. when he started, he talked about you being launched into space seven times, you know, the maximum times a human has ever been there. How, how did it feel the first time you went compared to the last time you were going? Actually, they felt about the same every time. I, obviously, I knew more of what to expect, but it still was a very exciting ride, and uh, it never became uh, something that was boring. 
I have to tell you, my first flight was the 23rd flight overall of the space shuttle program. And we had had very detailed uh, debriefings by every crew when they got back from a mission. And I thought that I understood pretty well what to expect when it came time for me to fly my first flight. But literally about 15 seconds after a liftoff on my first mission, I caught myself thinking to myself, Ross, what are you doing here? It was a pretty exciting ride. How many times did that thought cross your mind, especially your family? You said Just your one. wife, and yeah. weren't they fearful? I mean, how did you overcome that? Well, what did you I, assure them? My, my wife was a tremendous supporter. She knew that I would not be a happy camper if I didn't get to do what I loved doing, what's something I'd pursued my entire life to do. Uh, my daughter went into engineering uh, fields, and she was cheering and yelling and screaming as I lifted off the first time. And my son, who was kind of a little bit more of the touchy-feely kind of guy, was crying because he was worried that maybe I wouldn't make it back home. You've, you've also been uh, you know, spending a lot of your time working on genealogy. I mean, uh, tell, us, tell us more, you know, understanding a lot of your roots. You said you discovered you were related to the Wright brothers. Yeah. And what's the legacy that your family is going to carry forward? Well, um, I had always thought that I would like to know more about my family history and where my roots uh, were. And so, uh, uh, when we were getting ready for my sixth flight, we had a delay in the launch of, of several months, and the whole crew took off for about six weeks, and I spent most of that time going back to Indiana and spending time with my parents and then with my in-laws to collect all the information that I could, pictures and documents and going to graveyards and churches and, and libraries and everything else and just trying to collect as much information as I could, and that's where, how I started. And I just continued to pursue that. And I now know that uh, a good share of my, uh, my uh, genealogy uh, is traced back to uh, Ireland, uh, some to Germany, and also a lot of it to the Netherlands. And my wife's is very heavily in uh, the UK islands. Do you see your family next generation continuing to be space explorers? Well, my daughter uh, is a Purdue graduate as well in mechanical engineering. She has bachelor's and master's from there, and she is currently working, leading a team of engineers that's designing the next spacesuit that will be uh, tested on the International Space Station, and it could very likely be the prototype of what would be used for the next crew members to go to the moon and potentially onto Mars. She actually applied for the astronaut program uh, a couple times ago, and we were excited and pleased for her when out of 6,000 people, she was one of 120 that were actually interviewed by NASA. But we were very frustrated when she wasn't one of the eight that were also actually selected that time. But she's had a very uh, proud career with NASA. She enjoys what she does. And uh, for any of the young people that are watching what we're doing here, I would certainly encourage them to think about a career uh, in engineering or science and uh, working at uh, NASA or the Indian Space Program. It's an exciting and thrilling thing to do. No, thanks. Thanks for giving us a good peek into something which is more personal to you, your thoughts and your family. You know, I still remember in 1995 when, you know, I graduated from Purdue in remote sensing and joined NASA briefly after that. You know, the, the whole locking with Mir, you know, the, the docking with Mir and, and how the the fact that you also mentioned, you know, being greeted in space must have been a crazy high. And nowadays we see uh, and we hear a lot about space travel, about the costs of space transportation coming down significantly. I mean, looking into the near and little, you know, visible future, do you see hundreds of thousands of people actually going for a joyride into space, being no. able to, <laughs> to really enjoy the experiences that you had? And, 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 and really, how, how do you, what, what's your bet on the future? Well, I don't think there'll be hundreds of thousands of people that will enjoy a ride into space. I think there'll be a select few uh, people who have fairly uh, large bank accounts that will be able to pay for that type of an opportunity. I, I truly hope and pray that uh, those systems that are being developed will be successful. Uh, they have not been developed to the standards that NASA would build their spacecraft to. And it makes me concerned that uh, there might be problems in the future. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, 
I'm going to, since we have a short time, I'm going to open it up uh, to the audience. And, you know, if you could just raise your hand, just quickly introduce yourself and ask a brief question uh, to Jerry. Uh, we have about five minutes, so we'll take a few questions. Yeah, please. Hi, uh, my name is Sanket Mahajan. I am a mechanical engineering graduate. I did a PhD there in 2007. Uh, one of my questions is uh, the, the moon landings in 1960s and 70s and the spatial program. One of the drivers was, you know, the, the competition. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, the in thing, uh, the hard thing to do. I don't see that happening right now. So will that hinder the space uh, exploration? Is it the reason that it is not as, because my generation, like 10 years ago, we were not very enthusiastic about space. I mean, I was very happy that I got into Purdue and with the legacy that Purdue had, but that was not. So do you think that hindering space exploration, the funding, that, as, you, as you said, that you get, uh, and is that the reason that we are kind of, you know, not that uh, uh, pursuing that as vigorously as, as, as then? the Cold War, or all those drivers were there. Yeah. I, I think your perception is very accurate. Uh, is this working? Yeah, okay. Uh, I think it's very accurate. I think the primary reason that uh, the United States decided to go to the moon was because of the Cold War that was going on at that time. And it was a, a technological demonstration, if you will, of, of uh, the free world's capabilities as opposed to the communist world. And I think that's primarily the reason it went. I think it's primarily the reason that the Congress and the American public supported it. At one point, NASA had 4% of the US budget being used on the space program. We are less than one half of 1% now. So I think that should tell you a lot about where we are in terms of the priorities of the US federal government in terms of their spending. Uh, that's still quite a bit of money but it's not uh, of the size that would allow us to do things like going back to the moon very quickly and or preparing to go to Mars. Great, thank you. Yeah. I am Ajit Chirodkar, Pharmacy 6365. Ross, you had an excellent presentation but I thought it was straightforward exploration, exploration of the space. You narrated it very nice and your experience of long journey. I have two personal questions to you. One, during your long tenure, did you come up with out of the box ideas? One, to help slightly change the course of the NASA's uh, future uh, dealing with the space, and second, to promote Purdue as the place to look for for the future astronauts. Okay. Well, every time I talk to young people in schools, I always tell them several things. I tell them to figure out what their talents are and what their likes and dislikes are, and how they could use those to set a chart, a, a course for, uh, their, their life and their career. And I always end that, and I always end that by saying, and of course you should go to Purdue University to get your degree. But then, did you tell the NASA? Does NASA do that? Yeah. NASA, not NASA, uh, NASA does have uh, programs that address uh, their programs to the general public. They're not funded very well. And I frankly don't think they're very well done. Now, the first part of the question was, again, I. No, your out-of-the-box idea with your experience to change slightly the way that they are handling this okay. exploration. OK. Your idea. You, you're, you're, you're asking me if I'd like to be king for a day? Yeah. <laughs> sure. Sure, why not? OK. If I was king for a day, I would do exactly what I just got done saying. I would go back to the moon, I would do it as quickly as I can, 
and I would uh, start to develop and demonstrate all of the uh, capabilities and technologies that we need to have to prepare ourselves to be ready to go to Mars. I think anybody that talks about going to Mars next week is crazy. <laughs> they do not have the knowledge, they do not have the capability, and it will be probably a very lonely one-way trip. Yeah. Go so, ahead. Uh, hi, Jerry. Excellent presentation. And um, I would like to take this opportunity to ask you about the current um, you know, fear that I have, a little fear in my mind. Uh, this is with regards to the weaponizing of the space, you know, some country shooting down satellites. And so I would like you, you having first an experience, you were talking about micro meteorites and, you know, other, other stuff. So you are yeah. the best person to answer, you know, what are the risks or how, how we should perceive it. Yeah. Yes. Talking about space junk and debris. Is that primarily yeah. what you're talking about? So weaponizing the space, you know, like countries are doing it nowadays. And I would like your views on that. Okay. Using space weapons, shooting each other satellites. So yeah. that's happening nowadays. We, right. we, should, we should not be doing anything that creates more space junk or debris. There's already too much of it up there. It is a hazard that we have to monitor all the time. And we eventually will have to change the orbit of the International Space Station from time to time to av avoid the larger concentrations of space debris that we can track. But there certainly is a lot of debris that we can't track, and so that could uh, do damage to the vehicle. Uh, most of the time when we're flying, flying in uh, the space shuttle or the space stations, we're at a fairly low orbit of maybe 200 nautical miles or, or below. And when space junk gets down to that orbit or altitude, it will re-enter the Earth's atmosphere fairly quickly and burn up and be gone. But you go above 200 miles, say to maybe 600 miles, there is a tremendous amount of space junk up there. Some of it's accidental because a, uh, a used rocket engine or rocket bottle broke up and, and uh, maybe it got hit by a meteorite or something itself, or maybe it over, a tank overpressurized and, and ruptured. Uh, but the Chinese also created a tremendous amount of debris when they did an anti-satellite demonstration where they blew up an old satellite and created a real mess. So we need to do everything we can to prevent that. Uh, we need to see if there isn't some way that we could police or gather up some of the larger concentrations and deorbit them so that they are less of a chance to be a problem. But if we started doing wars in space, it would be uh, a place where you would not be able to use it for anything because it would destroy any satellites or rockets that were up there relatively quickly. Yep. So we've kind of run over time, but we take the last question. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jerry Ross, for your lively presentation and giving us the experience of space. I am from the law background, especially into space law. So let me ask you a few questions which are not related to science, but more related to law. Uh, what I want to know is that uh, b before going to space, you might have done a lot of paperwork. So what kind of paperwork you un underwent? And second, paper. And second, uh, like your contractual agreements or anything you underwent. And second, like you said that the future with regard to moon exploration would be in a cooperative program. So if that is so, what kind of uh, legal regime do you see developing with regard to these future activities? Okay, well there was a, an expression in the Air Force that you couldn't take the airplane out to fly it until the paperwork equaled the weight of the airplane. <laughs> and I think NASA learned that same lesson. There certainly is a lot of paperwork, but I have come to appreciate the amount of paperwork that was involved because when we had accidents or we had problems with a piece of hardware, through all that documentation, we could track back the materials and the manufacturing all the way back to the hole where the ore was dug out of the ground if we had to, to see if we could figure out why that part failed or why it didn't work properly. So it, it is a pain to do all that paperwork but it was very beneficial to us in the long run. And the second half of the question was? A lot more. Uh, when when, uh, when uh, we decided that we were going to do the space station and call it the International Space Station, 
Uh, there were a lot of people at NASA that were groaning and moaning and rolling our eyes because we knew it was going to be a lot of paperwork, a lot of meetings, different time zones to consider, different measurement systems, different customs, different design theories, I mean the whole nine yards, you, you name it. But I have to tell you that overall, having done the International Space Station in the matter that we did it, I think has been extremely beneficial. It has allowed us to do that once and to learn all of the hard things the first time and hopefully the only time. And uh, it has given us a much larger, a much better understanding of each other's capabilities and uh, given us a much more uh, strong feeling that we can rely upon our other partners to deliver what they promise that they're going to do. So I think it's been valuable. You know, and I, I must ratify that once that paperwork is all done, you know, you actually have the opportunity of doing something for the first time in the world. And that excitement and all of that, that it opens up after that, I think is, is just a thrilling experience. And I think the one giant leap that you talked of was definitely the inspiration for me to go to Purdue. And your multiple giant leaps post that, you know, keep me inspired. And I'm sure everybody here inspired, uh, you know, about the, the, the joy and the pride that our institution, you know, brings to us at all times. And right. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much you. for such a wonderful morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.